pornography is the actor yeah. inside us because it doesn't exist actually without that. Like that, you know, that that is the ultimate aspect. That's the, the, the vehicle by which the story is really being told, and and they must be a part of that conversation as well, yeah. or it doesn't work. Well, and in terms of that, and just what we were circling around the thing is that first, one of the very first things I do is like, if I can get them all together in the actual space and in the space, and then I put a little actor on there, or sit in there, and I sit and I figure out how, what the relationship with the audience is to that actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think and then if you're doing realism, one of the other things, no matter how much furniture or walls you can afford, to make sure that whatever many steps the actor takes is the number of steps for your imaginary. Run. <laughs> yes, the audience gets it. You know, I, yeah. it's just a body thing. The audience will get it. I think I think the audience is also a, a very important aspect to cinematography because I think we can we use them. We use what we perceive, how they how we think they would perceive this, and I think they are also part of the process. And I think you know, a lot, you know, uh, we can guess that the audience will understand this image and this metaphor. Um, it's up to them at that point when they see the show to fill in the blanks, to fill in the gaps, especially if you're not doing a realistic set, I think. To, to, they fill in the rest with their imagination. They can see the train if we're smart about it and if we're clever about it, but not too. And, you know, and well, and I think it's like in um, architecture, there's, they use the term of legibility of a building, like the legibility of the design of the building. And, the, the, and I feel like that we have that, we are, we, it's our job to make it legible. It's also then being able to understand what you're looking for. Being able to read it, like legible, you know, like really being able to read a structure. And Where is the front door going to be? Yeah, and, and, and what is this building by the shape of it? And what is it, you know, you know, like the AGO, I think the legibility of that building is beautiful. It's easy to imagine that that's like not... Inspired, you know, obviously. Yes, exactly. And, and so, and then as building, as architecture has gone and changed and been influenced by that, and what these different kinds of things, how much more people say with buildings, you know, like, there's also fun things, maybe it's a little bit uh, mean, but I, there's fun, I, I, there's some shows where I like using the audience's experience as part of the design, or how they perceive, or what the transformation that they go through to, to and how they perceive design, and, and uh, so one example is they enter a space, and they see the show, the way they exit the space, or how emotionally they, end, they exit the space, should be very different how they enter and so in some you know factory studio is a fantastic venue to do this in because you can control how they enter the space if they have to duck if they have to go through a front door and walk through somebody's living room they watch this play they watch this tread or something happen and you have to walk back to that exact same space and that feeling of suddenly being in somebody's living room of, of you know and having seen this action and uh, and then walk back out of that i think it's sometimes fun to play with and I, and I love to, I love, whenever I can, I love trying to use that because I think the audience's experience um, of the narrative is also the narrative, you know, or can also be part of the narrative and it's always been fun to do. Yeah, I mean, in, in Lady in the Red Dress, for example, I mean, you did, you know, sort of really, really subtle things um, for the audiences, you know, whether all of them got or not, to discover within, you know, the box of walls or, It'll just be a bottle right there that will be a big clue to the, the, the key to the entire universe of the play. And it's just sitting right there in a the bottle, and I'm just going, yeah, let's see if the audience will, will get it, and, you know. And you know, and some even student matinees afterwards, and like, I saw that bottle. Like, what does that mean? Like, you know, so like we'll we'll, we'll do stuff really to to kind of, I think for me, actively engage them. Um, it's like really, you know, I don't like it when I have to feed them stuff. I want them to do a little bit of work as well, you know, to really look for things and, and think about things, and, you know, and I mean, that's the kind that uh, I'm after uh, with working in relationship with an audience. Just made me think of one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had as an audience was at the Berliner, watching the, Re the Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui mm -hmm. and, in the Berliner Ensemble, and, 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 and when the doors open for the, at the end of the first act, after we just watched Hitler learn how to see Heil from the actor, which is the most <laughs> is hilarious to do that in Berlin, I have to say, <laughs> with a guy that really looked like Hitler, and um, a, a 
really old German actor, famous old German actor. And that's, you know, there's that whole scene about you must, whenever you talk, you're supposed to hold your arm up. You know, like, that's how you are, right? And so every time he, he let his arm, no, oh, not oh, he was just doing this. <laughs> it's really funny. But the doors to the, opened into the lobby, and there were wolves howling out in the lobby. Wolves? Wolves. The soundtrack. Yeah. And it was, and, and, and it, was, it was absolutely, it was right when there was a, a rise in um, anti-Semitic anti sort of, um, there was a very big anti-Semitic movement in the East, East Bloc of Eastern Europe at that time. So to kind of go from that and then to kind of go out into the wolves was like, <laughs> you know, like, it was an unbelievably perfect. Uh, Did you do that? Was that a design? Well, I'm sure it was part of, that's what I mean, it was part of the totality of this thing, you know, it was a, it was a production that they did spend a year making, you know, and then there was practically no design, and probably there was, I mean, yeah, absolutely, but I think of it as the whole, like, I think of it as part of the whole thing, and making, making the play ring out in a, in a, and it was in German, I mean, I only, you know, I got Amma. <laughs> I think you put a good example there that with uh, sonography can be sound and light yeah. and, and the visual too. I mean, and, and I, I think it's the, the designer's responsibility to come up with a good sound if, if that's uh, part yeah. of the concept. I think that's all part of it. Yeah. Actually, I, I must say that one of the, the things you should look at is, is the Czech approach. And the, Czech, the approach Czech. in Czechoslovakia. Because they, they never analyze theatre and, and film down, down to a, a degree and they have this whole system of coming up with a concept. Oftentimes when I work sound is usually sometimes first, like Romeo always comes up with the first thing and then he'll burn us CDs and so all the other designers, the lighting designer, Cavi will have the CD and you know for Banana Boys I know that my lighting designer was very much by the soundtrack of the show. So that was our starting point. So it's one good thing about these little designer workshops that we have because, because all the designers start at the same time at the beginning, as opposed to the sound designer who do it later, or the audio designer who do it later. Everybody's starting from the, from the same place, from the same time. I, I think that's, I'm gonna, I, I would identify that as being a change Of it is so, oh, I 
I'm so grateful to those guys. I have to say, 